everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm so excited to introduce our presenter for today, Leah Gropo. She is a clinical dietitian, certified diabetes care and education specialist, and is also board certified in advanced diabetes management. She currently works at Stanford's endocrinology clinic and diabetes care program. We're so lucky to have her presenting on this fun topic today of experimenting with lower carb substitutions. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the question and answer box on the webinar. Thank you, Catherine, for that great introduction. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this Thursday evening. Um, today, we wanted to talk about some lower carb substitutions. Um, so these are ones that are my family's favorite. There are many out there. I'm sure you all have your own. Um, and I kind of wanted to start off this talk to let you know, um, it's not that we're saying you have to substitute all things that have carbohydrates with substitutions, but sometimes it's nice to think about ways to add more vegetables or maybe to mix up our, our diets. Maybe we notice we have um, our favorite pasta dish, for example, or rice dish. We check our blood sugars. Two hours later, it's always above maybe our targeted 180 blood sugar. Um, and so maybe that's an idea to sort of start con con contemplating some of these healthy substitutions. So not saying that we're saying cut out all the carbs, but just saying these are maybe some options to try. Um, so today, my favorite type of substitutions are ones that add more non-starchy vegetables into our diet, because I feel like non-starchy vegetables don't get the um, cheerleaders that other kind of foods may get from other people. So I will be the vegetable cheerleader. It's my mission in life. Um, also, I feel like for um, 2022, I really, really wanna kind of focus on finding the joy in healthy behavior changes. So I feel like sometimes it's easy, especially in January, February time, to kind of get into this mindset like, oh my goodness, I have to make a change on my health. It's not really something I'm super jazzed or pumped about doing, but maybe my diabetes educator or my doctor is kind of recommending that I really um, embark on this healthy change. Um, so we really wanna try to put the kind of fun spin on making healthy behavior changes, um, especially through our wellness webinars. It's one of our community events that we do. Um, it's open to anyone. If you have uh, family, friends who might want to join us, everybody is welcome. Um, we also post the recording at the end on the Health Library website and our Diabetes Care Program website, so you can take a look at it after, um, as well as the recipes. So all the recipes today will be um, typed out. We will send them to you, as well as post them with the video. So if you have any extra questions. So without further ado, thinking about um, this Thursday, we're going to keep the idea of fun um, at the forefront of our, of our brain, uh, maybe fun and delicious. Those are our two key buzzwords maybe for today. So we're going to actually start off with something that um, we really love to do in my house. Uh, my daughter, who's two years old, um, really enjoys carrot french fries. So I wanted to share this recipe with you all. It's something that I love because it's super versatile. So for people who know me very personally, everybody knows that I'm not always the best at following recipes. I love to get ideas um, and sort of run with them and maybe make um, adaptations. So look in my fridge, see what I have, make something similar. Um, I wrote out my recipes exactly and measured things for you all, but normally on a Thursday night, I'm normally throwing together dinner um, quickly and it could have a variety of flavors. Um, so today, starting off, I just took carrots, um, just carrots that you can buy in the store in the three pound bags. We normally buy them by three pounds, but you can buy them one pound, whatever works for you. Um, I peeled them um, and then I just chopped them into little pieces. Um, so pieces like this size. So, I will say for making mini, mini carrot french fries, we really do want to think about making our, our carrot pieces a similar size. Um, because when we don't, some carrots cook at a different temperature and can get kind of burned um, while others are not quite done yet. Um, so we take carrots. This is uh, three different carrots. Um, I actually normally make them in batches of like 10 carrots, which is a lot, but we are um, avid carrot uh, french fry eaters. 
um, also enjoy regular french fries, but sometimes we have carrot fries instead. Uh, so if we think about, let me flip some of this over so you can have a good vision. Um, so here's our carrots chopped up. I add, I add about um, half a tablespoon of oil, any kind of oil. Uh, these cook at a high temperature, 425. So I typically add avocado oil to them because avocado oil is a oil that's heat stable, more heat stable at higher temperatures versus like an extra virgin olive oil or olive oil. When you get to like the 425 range, um, their smoke point is uh, below that. And so your carrot fries may kind of have a burnt, not delicious flavor. So I normally use um, avocado oil. Um, or you could use canola oil, peanut oil, whatever you have on hand is fine. Um, so I take that and I sort of mix them around and then I have my, uh, sort of my favorite spices. So um, I always put some pepper, I just shake it on. Um, I always add onion powder and garlic powder. I buy these in um, super bulk sizes because I love these seasonings. They're um, great flavor adders without adding a lot of salt to things. Um, and so I just kind of sprinkle that on, um, probably about a half a teaspoon. Um, same with garlic powder. This is non-salted garlic powder. So if you want to add a little bit of salt, you can. Um, I normally add salt into my hand first um, and then just add like a pinch. Uh, and then I kind of mix it around with my hands um, until they're all coated. Um, they're all separate, nothing's on top of each other. One of the reasons, this is what it looks like. One of the reasons why I really like to do um, carrots on the higher heat, for example, is because then we're not steaming our carrots. We also don't want them to be um, right on top of each other. We want them a little separate because if they're on top of each other, they have a lot of water content and they'll actually start to kind of steam each other. And we really want crunchy, crispy, delicious uh, carrot fries, not soggy um, steamed carrot fries. If we want to steam them, we could definitely steam them on the stove. Um, but for this, we want crispy, crunchy. Um, so that is all you need to do. Um, plus preheat your oven to 425 and then you just pop them in. I do normally make these in large carrot bunches. So this is a very small version of what we normally make, but um, I'm just gonna put this into the oven. Um, and at the end, we will be able to see the carrot fries at the very end. Um, typically I cook them for 25 to 30 minutes. Um, so we like our carrot fries a little bit more crunchy. Um, so we cook them for a little bit longer. But if you like them less crunchy, you can always take them out whenever you want to. Um, one of the things I think people kind of do when they are trying substitutions with non-starchy vegetables and trying to make them taste more like starchy vegetables. For example, later on, we're gonna do a cauliflower rice recipe. Um, they don't cook them long enough. Um, and one of the reasons why I always recommend cooking things if you're taking a non-starchy vegetable like cauliflower and trying to recreate something that's more starchy like rice, you wanna cook it until um, the starches can really cook down, some of that fiber can cook down so the mouthfeel is a little bit more starchy. Is it going to taste exactly like uh, rice? No, but um, it gets it a little bit closer. Um, so we started the carrot fries. So next we're gonna go into our cauliflower um, rice. So I feel like this was really popular maybe a couple of years ago. And then I think maybe people didn't quite cook it long enough or um, maybe didn't like it as much. And so it kind of lost some popularity. But today I wanna show you how I like to make my cauliflower rice. Um, and what I do is um, I typically will start either with um, kind of a raw cauliflower, depending on what I have, or oftentimes I'll also um, just buy a frozen cauliflower bag. So I keep a lot of these stocked in my freezer and that's super easy. You just take it from frozen, put it in your pan and you can cook cauliflower rice very quickly. Um, if you don't have frozen cauliflower and you wanna make cauliflower rice from scratch, um, 
I normally just take a little grater. I think these are like maybe $6, $7 um, at the store. I take my cauliflower after I've washed it and I just grate down the, some of the white part. So I just start grating like this. Um, and as I grate, it kind of um, gets into kind of like rice-like pieces, if you can see. So we like to have them kind of looking like that. Um, and so you can also use this. I do think that when you use fresh cauliflower, cauliflower, like most vegetables, has a high water content. Um, so you really do want to get your pan nice and warm. Um, use a high heat oil that can go high heat um, so you can start cooking it so that the cauliflower doesn't overly steam on itself because then it will get like really mushy and not as delicious. Um, so for this recipe, really today, I wanted to show you how I do it with frozen cauliflower um, because I don't know about you all, but I feel like especially nowadays, um, life is super busy and always my goal is to get be able to get dinner on the table or food going in maybe like 30 minutes or so. So I prep on the weekends and then dinner can be ready in 30 minutes in general. Um, cauliflower rice in our family is a side. Um, it could be a main course if you wanted to add some protein to it. Really, it's just non-starchy vegetable and some fat because we add some oil. But if you wanted to add maybe more vegetables, if you want to add some starch, like maybe corn and peas, starchy vegetables into your cauliflower rice to make it more like a fried rice, add some egg or add tofu or chicken, um, whatever you want to do. You can kind of adapt it. Um, so this is heating up on, um, so I have a little bit of oil. I normally just use probably like maybe half, half a teaspoon um, to a, a tablespoon-ish of oil, depending on how much I'm making. Um, I love gadgets, so I always use uh, my garlic press. I prep some garlic over here, um, and I really want my pan to get um, nice and warm. I don't think it's quite there yet, um, but I always try to use my garlic press. It's not great to clean, but it makes uh, pressing garlic really easy. easy. Um, some other people, if you want to dice it, you can smash the garlic and dice it up. That also works. Um, so this is two cloves of garlic starting in the pan. Um, and that will be, um, that will start cooking. And when um, this garlic starts getting sort of, you start smelling it when you're cooking, um, I think a great way to make cooking super fun is immersing yourself in the smells of the kitchen and really enjoying that. Um, I love the smell of um, toasting garlic, sauteing garlic. So I normally am kind of waiting for the sizzle sound, waiting for the smell, um, waiting for it to get very lightly tan before I add my cauliflower rice in. Um, so I'm going to do that. It's starting to sizzle. You can, if you all want to, you can see. That looks awesome, Leah. And while you're cooking and sauteing right now, we have some related questions about why are you choosing avocado oil versus other oils and what's best for the smoke point? Yeah, that's a great question. So I like avocado oil because it goes to a higher smoke point. I believe it's like 500, but um, I mean, we could double check that. Uh, so it goes a lot higher. Um, I also like um, just different higher smoke point oils versus um, like a lower smoke point oil. Uh, point oil would be like an olive oil. So I think more olive oils tend to be better for salad dressings, um, better for finishing. If you want to put like a little drizzle oil of finishing, um, better for lower heat. If you're going to kind of um, like make a stew or simmer something a little bit better for that. Um, Cause you do lose out some on some health benefits. Um, if you go past a smoke point because the oil um, starts breaking down um, and then you lose some of those health benefits. Um, olive oil has a lot of monounsaturated fatty acids like mono one single bonds. Um, and so they're more apt to go, um, they're, they're less stable versus ones that have more um, polyunsaturated fats. Okay, that was the perfect length question because right now, um, if you can see, if you can hear, I don't know if you can hear, our garlic is uh, toasty. 
um, and it's sizzling. Um, you don't see smoke, which is also a good thing. Um, we're gonna put in our um, cauliflower rice. Um, again, not defrosted um, and just kind of ready to go, give it a little shake. And then we're just gonna let that cook. Um, it started at high heat, so it's not gonna steam on itself. It's gonna hopefully um, have a nice little sort of brown color. And then I actually have another extra trick at the end um, that I do for my family to make cauliflower rice more a main staple, something that people ask for and look for um, versus just doing plain cauliflower. Um, so I can go over that as well. Um, so moving on, Catherine, do you have any questions? Any other questions? Uh, some other questions we have are, what's the difference between smoke point and rancid? rancidity for oils? Oh yeah, that's a good question. So um, typically oils tend to be in um, darker, sort of like not as uh, light piercing bottles um, because they can go rancid. And so when they're rancid, like if you um, smell your oil, it doesn't smell quite right. It, um, it's almost like a little fishy smell um, and then it's not delicious anymore, not great to use. Um, and so that's basically like your oil is spoiled. Um, so you don't really want the, to let that happen versus the smoke point is actually putting it in a situation of high heat um, and then the bonds are breaking down and it's um, smoking. Lots awesome. of oil questions. That's good. Thanks, and I, I honestly do think that um, for oils, like it can be very custom. So I think it's actually really great. Sanford has, um, I think, 50 dietitians that all specialize in different areas. Um, and so if you see a dietitian, you can ask like, what's the best oil for me to be cooking for myself and my family? Um, I work in the endocrine clinic and the diabetes care program. And so I'm really thinking about um, things that are heart healthy. And I'm also um, sort of focusing on that and like cholesterol, things that are healthier for cholesterol. Um, so that's kind of my vision. So I think maybe you could ask other dietitians and different specialties and may they may have some other um, insight into their own specific specialty, but that's kind of the lens that I look at. Uh, blood sugar um, and heart health, um, blood pressure. So those are all sort of in my, in my wheelhouse in my realm. Moving that, yeah, great. Um, okay, so moving along, um, is it getting a little dark or can you all still see? Okay, we can see you. Okay, great. Uh, so I don't know if anyone has ever tried tofu noodles. Um, they're also called shirataki noodles. Um, they're made with yam, a special yam fiber um, called konjac yam. And so I really like to cook with them. I feel like they're a great option to add um, really low carb, low calorie noodles if you want kind of a delicious noodle dish. It's not that you have to always substitute them um, because that would probably get a little bit expensive, but they're fun to play around with. Um, so the one that I tend to buy looks like this, but they come in all different types, all different brands. Um, sometimes like different like Asian stores can cook, look like this or the package sometimes also is lavender. But the biggest thing to look, um, also sometimes they're called like miracle noodles you can find in some of the more boutique stores. Um, you wanna really look um, and the carbohydrates are gonna be low on them and you wanna either see uh, konjac flour or yam flour with um, in combination with like a lower carb, maybe like six grams or less per package. Um, so it's not like a glass noodle, something that is higher carb. So that's kind of how you find these. Typically they're in um, the refrigerator section, but the miracle noodles um, don't need to be refrigerated. So they're not. You can find them in the regular stores. You can find them in Asian stores specialty stores, they're kind of everywhere. Um, typically they're by, like in, um, I have a Lucky's by my house, so I go to Lucky's. Um, they are by the tofu, in the tofu section, in the, in the vegetable aisle. Um, I think same with Safeways, um, Knob Hill, probably Sprouts, all of those places would have them in a similar location. Great. Um, I think those noodles, um, someone's asking, is it the same as soy noodle or different? Soy noodle, um, I think probably different. Maybe you could ask them to clarify like what the nutrition facts look like mm -hmm. on soy noodle. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of different kinds of noodles. There's also like a, a glass noodle that is does end up being a little bit starchy. There's like bean flour noodles um, that can be a little bit more starchy, which are also okay. But um, these are the ones that I, I've tested these recipes out and I really tend to like. Since they are really low carb, the mouthfeel is going to be different. And one of the things I always let people know, and it may deter people, but when you open the package, they have kind of a funky smell, like a little bit weird seafoody smell. Um, but I always take the noodles, uh, rinse them, and then, um, then they're basically ready to go. Um, and so today I'm going to make noodles two different ways. So I can show you the final product actually. Um, so I'm going to make um, sort of like more of an Asian, like a garlic noodle. Um, and then I'm also going to make more of like a Italian noodle with homemade um, tomato sauce, which is one of my favorite things um, to make in general. Um, so we're going to start both of these pans. Great. Um, and we're going to... Um, Start both of those, and both of them will actually get garlic in the pan, a little bit oil and garlic to start with. So, um, I'm going to put my garlic in. Um, a little bit of oil. Um, I'm not a huge uh, fan of measuring just because I like to cook really quickly. So, uh, but I did measure these recipes out. So the ones that you'll see at the end have measurements. Um, but do what's best for you and your family. So, for example, if um, you want to use less oil, some people will use um, oil spray instead, um, which you can do. Some people like. Um, you can always get your own like spray bottle and put whatever oil you want to cook in and use that. Um, sometimes a little sprayer can get clogged. Um, so in that case, you would just want to make sure um, that you just soak it in warm water to unclog it. So you have some oil, you have some garlic in the pan in both pans. I have them on medium heat. Um, so we are also, we're gonna kind of simultaneously prep for both. Um, so for the Italian uh, uh, style sort of noodles, I'm just gonna make um, a homemade tomato sauce. This is like uh, my favorite thing to make for dipping bread in, for having on pasta, for doing it with tofu noodles, um, eating it plain, eating it on cottage cheese. It's super versatile, it's so delicious, especially um, in my garden when we have lots of tomatoes. It's a great tomato user. Um, so I just chopped up one tomato, one large tomato. Um, this is just one I found in the store. And so especially right now, tomatoes aren't really in season. So the tomatoes don't look as delicious and are not as juicy. They travel normally kind of a long time to get here, but um, still tasty. And so I'm going to pour this into the front pan. So if you want to see, we just have the tomatoes in with the garlic and the oil. And it's just going to cook on medium heat. Um, and so for that one, we and then the second one, we have uh, the garlic and the oil. And then I also prepped vegetables. So um, this is also a great recipe because whatever you have in your fridge. So I'm a big fan of not having to go run out to the store at five o'clock when you want to get dinner on the table. Um, whatever I have in my fridge is what is going to become dinner. Um, I'm not going to go to the store at five. It's just not really in the schedule. So um, for this right now, I have um, shirataki mushrooms. I have like regular button mushrooms, white mushrooms. I have uh, zucchini in my fridge and I also have green bell peppers. Um, so I chopped all of those up. Um, my favorite way to chop is kind of a little bit thinner and keeping them long. I feel like it gives it a nice look. Um, so I'm just gonna put those veggies um, into my pan. Um, and let those cook down as well. Kind of stir them around. 
Um, and so as those are cooking down, when I'm thinking about in general, when I'm cooking, I'm always trying to think about how can I add more vegetables into whatever I'm cooking in a delicious way? So um, I'm not a huge fan of hiding vegetables. I think that vegetables shouldn't have to be hidden. Um, they're delicious. They add lots of color, add fiber, and of course, health. But you don't need to hide them. But how do we kind of get them into our meals, um, help them to sort of be a normal part of the way that we eat? Because I think that's... Um, for, at least for my family, I feel like that's a good way um, for my daughter to be able to see vegetables and get really used to eating vegetables. Um, so those are both cooking. I can stir them around. Um, they look good. I think actually, so um, normally I do a quick pour and I think on one of them, it got a little bit more oil than I was expecting, but um, that's how we, I guess, cooking it just every time it's a little bit different. <laughs> um, and then the tomatoes over time will sort, sort of start breaking down. Um, I've also done this recipe with cherry tomatoes that also can work um, if you want to use those. Sometimes I kind of help move them along by smushing out down the tomatoes. That can also kind of help. Um, Keep going with our cauliflower rice as well. And I think that for, for everybody coming today, um, you can definitely um, see if you can meet with a dietitian and get sort of like um, reference points about maybe what's best for your own health. But also I think probably you all can decide like what is best for you and your diet. If um, it's something you wanna try things that are lower sodium, um, kind of geared towards that. If you wanna get more fiber, um, more healthy plants into your diet. I feel like you can't go wrong with that in general. Um, if you want to do lower carbs or if you just kind of want to look at your overall energy intake or the quality of nutrition that you get, that's also, those are all sort of good ways to look at um, your nutrition and what's going on in your own like kitchen and with yourself or your family. Um. So we're still cooking these guys down. So you can kind of see um, the veggies are kind of getting crispy, um, a little sauteed. You can hear them, they're cooking. Um, now is a great time to think about, um, I'm not used to having three pans at once. Um, think about adding some noodles in. Um, so for me, I'll just add them with my hands. These have been rinsed. So it kind of looks like that. And we're going to stir it all around. That looks so good, Leah. I wish we were all there to smell the kitchen. I know. That's like one of the great ways. Um, I guess it's a lot louder than I thought. Actually, I normally, when I cook, um, I normally am um, cooking to uh, some type of Disney classic um, because that's what. My daughter likes to listen to you, but normally we have the music up really loud and we're cooking and dancing and trying to get ready for dinner. Um, so I normally don't hear how loud maybe the uh, the cooking of the veggies is, but now in a quiet household, it, it feels louder. Um, so I'm gonna still keep cooking down those um, tomatoes and sort of smashing them. You of course can chop things um, more finely if you can see that. Um, I feel like it's getting a little bit dark. Let me turn on the light. Let me get that. Is that better? Yeah. Um, so you can chop them a little bit more finely, and then they'll, um, they'll of course, cook down a little bit faster. Um, but also in the kitchen, I believe in um, shortcuts. I'm sure like if I was a chef, maybe I would not believe in shortcuts, but I am um, somebody trying to get food on the table or trying to feed myself. So I definitely believe in shortcuts. So I normally cook things as large as possible that will still cook. Um, that's why the tomatoes look like that, but they definitely cook down. And in the end, it actually tastes the same. It's not a big change. 
Um, so I definitely do that. They're starting to cook down. And so what you're looking for is um, they start kind of separating from the peels a little bit um, and they start getting mushy. That's definitely what we're looking for. Um, and to describe this flavor, the tomatoes um, start getting really delicious, um, sweet sort of like deep flavor when you cook them down this way. And so that's why I think um, it gives a, a really great flavor to the, the shirataki or tofu noodles. Um, because unlike other pasta or wheat-based pasta, flour-based pasta, they don't tend to absorb the flavor as well because um, it's more fiber-based and less starchy, if that makes sense. So when we do cook with uh, shirataki or tofu noodles, we really want to think about getting really like thick sauces that have a lot of flavor that can cling on to the noodles so they can be really tasty um, and delicious. Speaking of flavors, so you're cooking with a lot of non-starchy vegetables. An audience member is asking any particular spices or spice blends you like to use for vegetables to bring out their flavor? Yeah, that's an amazing question. So um, I would say my go-to uh, sort of spices are granulated garlic um, and granulated onion powder. Um, but I definitely, I guess, yeah, I, I definitely also like pepper. Um, is a great one. And then in regards to flavoring things, sometimes um, we have like a lemon tree or if you can find a uh, citrus that doesn't have like a waxy film on it, um, just grating some of the zest and putting it into things is um, really delicious and amazing. I also will buy ginger periodically and then for the next like three weeks, all my recipes will have ginger in them and then I won't buy ginger. And then for the next like month, no recipes will have ginger in them. Um, but ginger is also like a great thing to add. I think it always depends on what theme you're cooking in. So like if I'm thinking more um, Italian food, I'm gonna think about more like oregano. I'm gonna think about like um, parsley, uh, thyme, things like that, that sort of yield more of that flavor. If I'm thinking like Asian flavors a little bit more, I might be thinking more like garlic, ginger, shallot, um, like sometimes cilantro that also can go into like more Mexican food if I'm thinking about that, like cayenne and pepper. So I always think about um, what I'm, what flavors I'm trying to develop. Okay, this is getting ready. So I'm gonna take these drained noodles and put them into the tomato mixture. Um, I do normally cook it down a little bit more, but just for time in this, I will at it. Um, but if you can see, these tomatoes are really starting to cook down. They're kind of getting toasty and they'll continue to cook. And if we mix in, um, they mix a little bit more into the pasta. Um, and then going back to our um, more like garlic Asia noodle, I'm also going to add a little bit of oyster sauce to it. Um, it doesn't need a lot because oyster sauce can be kind of high in sodium, pretty high in sodium, so I normally just add a little bit. Um, I'm also gonna add a little bit of soy sauce, just a little. Um, and if you like spice, I love um, just chili flakes. So I'm gonna add in some chili flakes, uh, probably just like a quarter of a teaspoon or a pinch um, to that. And then um, for this, I'm actually gonna add a little bit of grated, fresh grated ginger. Um, I can do that over here. I'm gonna just kind of, I have one of these little graters. They're also, I think they're like, you can get them at like a dollar store. Um, and they're, they work very well. You just wanna keep your fingers away because they're very easy to grate. Um, so I just add like a pinch of ginger. That's actually really good. So kind of looks like this as we're going. Um, and then I will just kind of stir it up. So we have all our veggies in there and the noodles. Let me also not forget about our cauliflower rice, which is getting a little toasty.
turn that heat down, and then just kind of let that cook for a little while together. Um, so in, in a lot of Asian dishes, sometimes we will add like a, just a pinch of sugar. Um, you can do it or omit it. It's normally so small that it's like maybe one gram of carb or half a gram of carb. It's not something that's um, really going to spike blood sugar. You could also add um, like monk fruit has a very similar flavor. Um, I tend to not add uh, like a stevia or a splenda because I think that the, the taste may be a little bit different. Um, and you wouldn't want to kind of skew that, but if you want, you can add like the very smallest um, pinch and that can kind of um, enhance some of that flavor too. Heather, are there any questions? Not yet as of yet, but everything looks so great so far, mixing everything together. Yeah, great. Okay, so we're going to go back to our cauliflower rice um, and one of my main secrets, at least for my family, is I normally do um, half cauliflower rice and half regular rice. And I'll sort of stir fry and mix them together. Um, so it's not 100% cauliflower rice. I personally like that, um, but I am a huge cauliflower um, proponent. I love cauliflower. Um, but for others in my family, it's um, a lot easier to get them to eat it if you add some rice. Um, so I made some rice earlier. Um, I just steamed it um, versus like cooking it in my rice cooker, it's just like this. Um, I just made some white basmati rice. You can make brown rice, you can make um, Japanese rice, whatever you want. Um, I wouldn't do sticky rice though in this because I don't, that wouldn't really yield the same flavor. Um, but I normally just kind of add it in at the end um, and then sort of stir fry it together. And then we kind of get more of like a, a mixture, but um, it's like the best of both worlds. It's kind of like a compromise potentially. Um, I also made some cauliflower rice earlier um, from the fresh cauliflower. So I will put that in too. Um, so this is kind of what it ends up looking like. Um, you can also add, like, if you want to add some more veggies to it and make it like a fried rice and maybe add some corn and peas to it because um, it doesn't have that much starch um, and not that much rice. But I do want to point out that um, if you see how the cauliflower is actually a little bit browned, um, I think there's a couple burn pieces, but it was because I wasn't watching it. Um, but we want to really see this kind of like brown tan color because that means that um, the starches are breaking down. It's getting a little bit um, softer mouthfeel, more like rice, and it blends better into the sort of rice mixture. Um, so a little bit more delicious. With cauliflower rice, we never want to add water and boil it like we would rice. Um, that would be kind of like a mushy mess um, and not delicious, unless you like you want soup with cauliflower pieces in it. But um, this is how we really enjoy having it at home. Um, so I'll make this and it will be like a side dish um, easily. You can dress it up if you want to and add spices. You can add a little bit of um, soy sauce, sauce if you wanted to. Um, if you want to make it into fried rice, you could add some egg um, and some scallions, green onions, and sort of make it into more of a meal. Maybe add some protein. You could do tofu or ground turkey, ground chicken. Um, all of those would work. Well, it's awesome, Leah, and you get such a big portion with that as well. Someone's asking, how do these recipes hold up as leftovers? Great. Um, they hold up really well, actually. So I would say um, maybe we're a hungry family. We don't always have leftovers. It depends on how much I make. Um, like if I make um, two cauliflower heads, we'll definitely have leftovers. But if it's one cauliflower um, for my whole family, we'll eat all of it. Um, but it definitely holds up fine. Um, I'll bring them, uh, have them at lunch at work the next day. Um, they're great. And so actually, once you cook the tofu noodles, that weird smell doesn't seem to come back. Um, so you can easily heat it up at lunch um, if you want to make the noodles. And so the noodles are also done. I can add them 
add some extra to this. Like don't you go on my stove. It smells so delicious. Um, I was laughing. I was like, well, I guess we're going to have a lot of hodgepodge for dinner. There's going to be all sorts of things. Um, so this is what it looks like. We have our um, like bell peppers and our mushrooms in there. I like mushrooms too because they create like a umami, um, delicious sort of uh, filling, sort of meaty flavor um, into things. And so I think that that's always super delicious. Um, and then typically to finish this off, I'll add like a little bit of sesame seeds on the top. Um, and then this will be like a portion. She has super large portion, very filling. Um, but this is our sort of garlic noodle option. I think that our, um, our more Italian option uh, may take longer, a little bit longer to cook, but um, here is sort of the final product. And then I just put a little bit of Parmesan cheese on the top. Um, and then I finished this today with like a little bit of Italian seasoning because I wanted to sort of bring out more herby flavors. Um, but I've also made it just with the garlic um, and the tomatoes and really cooked that down and made a great sauce. Um, and sometimes you can add like chili peppers to this if you want. And on the recipe card, I'll have like all these substitutions and options um, and they don't change any of the carb amount. Um, and these are all definitely low carb. So if we look at this, this may be like um, 10 carbs total. Um, and then this portion is probably like eight carbs. And so it's really hard, eight to 10 carbs. It's really hard to get noodles um, that are so low carb because typically when we think about noodles, we think like a cup of noodles is around 45 to 50 grams, depending on the type of noodle. Um, so it's a lot lower carb option. So I think everything is off. Um, and so those are, I think all the lower carb options that I wanted to highlight. So to kind of uh, reiterate, we made, oh, let me get my, um, we made the, the carrots. I actually have ones that are done. Those aren't quite done, um, but we made the carrot French fries. Um, maybe I can show you a little bit closer. If you can kind of see, it's a little bit toasty, um, shrunken down in size. They're pretty tasty. I hope they look good on the video. They look good. Oh, awesome. But, um, yeah, so I normally cook them to that till they're like a little bit shrivelly. Um, that's how we like to eat them um, without sauce because I flavor them with a lot of things, but you could also eat them with a sauce if you wanted to, like a yogurt sauce, um, yogurt um like garlic dill type of sauce if you wanted to. Um, we also made um, our cauliflower rice um, with fresh cauliflower and frozen cauliflower. Um, we made our tofu noodles, shirataki noodles. We need, made like a garlic Asian one. And we also made more of like an Italian red sauce one. Um, so I think that was, those were all the recipes. So we did ended up doing um, like five recipes or so, I guess maybe four, more like four, um, but all in this kind of short amount of time. So hopefully that was helpful. I'm happy to take questions. Um, and I think just finishing, I hope that um, the joy from my kitchen is now into your kitchen. Um, and I really hope that we can find the joy and um, some of these healthy changes in 2022, because um, it's hard to do things if we're not having fun. So hopefully these recipes will spark some interest in your kitchen and you'll put your own spin on it, your own flavors. Um, and yeah, I super appreciate everybody coming tonight and sticking with it. So thanks for coming. Thanks so much for the amazing presentation, Leah. We do have some questions. So one is, and please clarify if I am misreading this, but I think they're asking if Someone's a big fan of oats, oatmeal. Uh, thoughts on substituting the rice that you paired with the cauliflower rice with oats? Oh, yeah, like steel cut oats. Um, so I feel like old fashioned oats might get a little bit clumpy. Um, you really want a rice that's 
stays, the grain stays separate. Um, so if you do still cut oats and you keep it less mushy, it would pair great, definitely great. Um, yeah, does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. And then one more question, how do you avoid getting hidden added carbohydrates in sauces? Oh yeah, that's a great, um, especially if we look at a lot of Asian sauces, um, have cornstarch in them, different starches. Um, so I think you can always look at nutrition facts. Um, if you have time, you can make things yourself. Um, and then also know that there's going to be some carbs and sauces that we have, and um, and that's totally fine. You just have to sort of see and think about um, the portion. Like if you're doing uh, cornstarch, that's a faster carb on um, flour-based noodles with sauces, that's just gonna raise your blood sugar higher faster, um, which is okay, but it's just something to be mindful of. A lot of my patients like to think about maybe having non-starchy veg first up front in the middle, of, in the beginning of their meal. Maybe they eat a salad or some steamed veggies, um, wait some time, like 10 minutes, um, and then eat the higher carb, higher starch um, diet. There's a research um, group at, I think it's Cornell, and they have a research lab and they've studied that when you put in non-starch veg and protein first and wait a little bit of time, your body's more able to sort of um, meet the needs of those higher carb foods later. If you have like type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes, if you have type 1 diabetes, it's easier because you don't have to pre-bolus as much with your insulin you're giving. Also, I wanted to go back to that first question. I think it's super great that you're already thinking about how to add in foods that you like in your house into these recipes um, because they're very adaptable. And that just makes me know that you're already thinking about sort of how to add these in. And I super love that. I think that's awesome. There's Any one other question, question about uh, just some further clarification about starchy vegetables versus non-starchy vegetables. So for example, like carrots, peas, and corn, how are they different? Yeah, that's a great question. So when we think about starchy vegetables versus non-starchy vegetables, we're thinking about available carbohydrates. So um, available or bioavailable carbohydrate, things that our body can actually use, um, absorb and can raise our blood sugar. Um, carrots have a really bad rap, but carrots actually don't have a lot of um, available carbohydrate, even though they taste sweet. Um, it would definitely depend on like different brand of carrots. Some carrots are a little bit sweeter and would have a little bit more um, sugar, but for the most part, they're still considered uh, non-starchy vegetable in my book. Um, peas and corn, I would consider starchy vegetables um, because they have more available starch. Um, they're a lot easier to use and we'll, you'll see a blood sugar bump from them, but they're great to add to things. Um, they give a different like mouthfeel versus if we think about um, green beans or peas or snap peas, what we eat in the casing of the pea, then they would become non-starchy vegetables because that whole casing is very fibrous and not starchy and not very bioavailable to our own starch. Um, so that's kind of also a differentiation, which gets a little bit complicated. Like why would peas be uh, starchy and green beans be non-starchy? But that's basically the reason. Um, I will say also when you cook carrots, the starches are a little bit more bioavailable. But if we think about cooked carrots, carrot fries versus potato french fries, um, we could have like the same volume portion. Um, and I can guarantee blood sugar will be lower with carrot fries than potato fries because potatoes have higher available carbohydrate. Um, also still even lower than um, sweet potato fries still have available carbohydrate, um, more so than like carrots, like parsnips, other root vegetables. Great, thank you so much, Leah. Those are all of our questions. It seems like getting a lot of thank yous and looks great and wonderful recipes. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I um, just definitely wanna say thank you to everyone coming. And um, it was super fun to prepare for, for this and sort of actually start measuring things out and realize that, oh, I thought I used this, but I actually use this much. Um, so hopefully you can also take these recipes and not hold them to like a black and white, but really hold them to like a gray or the whole spectrum of the rainbow and make them your own and things that your whole family likes and that you like, because hopefully cooking can be fun.
I mean, I like to eat, so I also very much like to play and eat with labor. So thank you all for coming. I really, really appreciate it. Um, and I hope that you can make next month. Um, I think next month in March, we're going to do a seasonal, another cooking demo with seasonal cooking. Um, so hopefully you can make that and we can think about all the delicious spring veggies and foods. Thank you, everybody.